Hello, welcome to your weekly Utopian chat. It is the third lecture in the um, Desire Utopia and Desire Through Sci-Fi class and today we're going to be discussing a book called Woman at the Edge of Time by Marge Piercy. And um, yeah, thank you. Thanks everybody for their contributions so far in on River. It's been a really, really interesting discussion about last week's um, topic. I hope we can kind of tie that up together um, with the, with the class today in the seminar and then we can kind of talk about everything at the same time. Um, and um, similar to last week, I'm going to start with a little bit of a recap and contextualization of the book. So if you haven't read it, you, you are likely to hear spoilers. Uh, and I apologize for that, but I don't think there is any other way of doing the class. Um, okay, so March Piercy, Woman at the Edge of Time. Um, it was um, so it was published kind of similar time to the book that we read last week that is possessed, um, <clears throat> but it has some significant differences that I think are um, kind of worth discussing and, and um, outlining. Um, it was March Piercy herself was um, more of a like if you can make that distinction more of an activist rather than a writer um, and her and, and you can kind of see that in the book as well um, I guess in actually there was some some people saying that in the in the river chat how um, also Le Guin felt like um, quite like an a or the dispossessed felt quite like an intellectual kind of exercise of about anarchism um, I think March PSC is quite different in the sense that it's um, much more kind of um, emotional and and you can kind of see um, more anger and and real life events and, and politics in it um, and it wasn't her first book she published March Piercy published two other books before that but neither of them was um, actually as famous or didn't uh, didn't do as well as uh, Woman on the Edge of Time um, Woman on the Edge of Time was published in 1976 um, and it kind of combines um, realism and utopian science fiction um, in, in um, quite an interesting way. Um, the book was um, quite instrumental um, in the way, or like I th if you remember what we talked about in Critical Ut Utopias and what Critical Utopias are, so the book was quite instrumental in, um, in kind of this trend, Critical Utopias. Um, and it um, combines things of kind of radical socialist, leftist, feminist, anti-racist politics. So it combines like a lot of um, anti-hierarchical uh, sentiments. Um, the book is about a woman called Connie, um, which is um, which actually I'll mention this now um, it's quite interesting because Connie um, has a few different names in the book um, which is um, I suppose something that is worth mentioning and talking about in relation to some of the themes that we're going to pick out of the book um, in the in the lecture um, the she's called Connie uh, which is kind of her American name um, and it's um, it's also a name that is quite kind of um, clearly related to a location where she is experienced lots of various types of oppression. Uh, she's um, a Latina woman. Um, she's in um, living in in poverty. Um, she has um, she's unemployed. She's a single parent. Uh, she's been branded as kind of mentally unstable, I suppose, or I can't actually remember what word is used in the book, but yeah. Um, and th and that these problems or like this this kind of oppression is is clearly related to to that name uh, because in her in Mexico, which she's from, um, she's uh, known as Consuela, um, and I can't, um, there was another name that she was. Um, she was using um, at some point. I think it was oh, when she's um, when she works as a sex worker. She's called Conchita, uh, which I think is also quite interesting. Kind of to, to to think about why she has three different names and what 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 is in the name. You know, what does it mean? 
um, she's the so she's a protagonist of the book uh, as I mentioned she's poor unemployed um, she comes from Mexico she lives on welfare she's in New York she lives in a ghetto um, kind of in the beginning of the novel we see a lot we see her experience her poverty quite a lot um, her husband's been killed I think um, and her I think it's her lover Claude is in prison um, she has a child she has a daughter um, that was taken away from her by the welfare agency um, because she was determined to be unfit as a mother um, after she I think slaps the child um, and um, so, so in the beginning of the novel, we kind of literally see her completely powerless. Um, she has absolutely no agency, no, um, no, no saying what happens in her life. Um, she's um, she's really struggling. Um, and then we um, um, at at some point, um, I think that's sorry. I, I should have actually really read the love of the novel, but I think it's at some point, uh, kind of quite early on, we meet her. Um, niece who also works as a sex worker and is suffering uh, violence from her um, from her pimp um, and Connie tries to defend her um, which um, results in Connie actually ending up in a mental health institution um, so it's not just that she's um, kind of completely oppressed she her, it, her she becomes even more powerless um early on in the novel um and in in the novel um she's um uh, uh she, she she has a lot of friends um she um she's she's not happy to be there um she's really struggling um and kind of the everything unfolds when i think it's in um maybe like second or third chapter quite early on everything unfolds when she has this vision of a person that she um, um perceives as male when she sees um and it's um um it, it i think it's quite interesting to try to unpick uh, a little bit the relationship between uh, fantasy and reality and where where there's fantasy come in um in particular kind of this dichotomy between the utopian society that she sees and the society that she lives in um, so she sees this vision this person that she perceives as male um, and they um, explain the name is Luciente I hope I'm pronouncing this right they explain that um, they c have come from the future uh, they um, that they say that Connie's a natural um, receiver I think or receptor something like this uh, so she she receives the the kind of tele telepathic uh, signals sent by this person, um, and um, and they've come from the future, and um, they want or they they start showing her the future of society uh, that they're living in. Um, so Connie's kind of transported mentally and physically to to this to this new society uh, by Luciente, and the rest of the novel is um, kind of the reader going from the reality in which Connie is living in, in the mental health institution and the uh, utopian society that she gets transported in, um, in the, in the future. The utopian society is based in, um, um, still in the US, in kind of contemporary Massachusetts, um, in a place called, um, I can't, I don't think I can say that correct, M Matapoiset. Mm. And it's the year uh, 2137, um, and as um, as we can kind of imagine, obviously, it's a class in utopia is a it's a pretty nice place to live in. Um, male supremacy and patriarchy have been ended. Capitalism has been defeated. Uh, it's referred to, I think, uh, it's referred to as like the wars um, uh, that came before that. Um, the society. Um, or, or like these wars have kind of culminated in a, in a revolution which has entirely changed society and the society there is very um, ecological, um, very kind of community minded it's, it's I guess kind of like a mix of some kind of um, anarchist, socialist, feminist 
um, anti-racist utopia uh, or post-racist utopia. Um, it's, um, it's a really kind of steady society, it's very decentralised, um, the, um, there's a lot of technology but it's kind of used in a prop in, in, in like a very kind of limited way so just for like the pro particular things that are appropriate um it's it's a, a, i guess kind of like anarcho syndicalist in the sense that we get the idea that different regions are more or less self-governing um and and trade with each other uh, but there isn't really any kind of monetary economy and every region is more or less self-sufficient apart from the, the things that they produce a lot of which they trade with the other regions um the uh, is it's like all the kind of basic necessities of life are more or less covered um there is some luxuries um but not many um people don't work very much so there's like a seems to be quite a short work day um there is um a lot of um it seems like crafts and enjoyable activities um there is um um yeah as i said like kind of high sophisticated um, technology but it's not overused i suppose um it's, it's just used for particularly dangerous tasks so there's like um some travel which is done through um hovercrafts i think they say or something like that uh, but mostly like there isn't much travel um, the energy is provided through technology, so things like solar energy, wind power, water power, um, uh, and of course genetics, which we're going to touch on in a bit. Um, the, um, the way that the society functions, I guess, is where and um, kind of the real utopian elements come in. Uh, at least for me, <laughs> um, is that um, the, um, the children are born through a, pr a kind of genetically organised technological process. Uh, so there aren't, um, nobody ha has, is pregnant, no nobody carries a baby. Um, it's all done through this kind of uh, reproductive machinery that um, Connie at some point sees and uh, she feels uh, quite upset about. She thinks it's, um, I suppose, um, kind of taken away from the concept of motherhood and the concept of parenting. Uh, she, she, she finds it quite unnatural and disturbing. Um, but anyway, so the, the children are born through this like machines. I imagine a bit like kind of the matrix where you see all the babies in the um, in the little whatever they are bags um, and the um, parenting is not done by like two lovers I guess two parents that are lovers uh, but it's done by a group of people um, that could be any combination of genders um, and the, it's usually kind of considered better to um, not be in love or in a relationship with these people i guess it's mostly like kind of your best friends maybe <laughs> um and this i think the number is actually not any but maybe three or four um and they're called co mothers um they they look after the child and uh when the child reaches puberty um they're kind of encouraged to um, go um through go on their own through kind of this initiation ritual where they're and maybe I think they're in the forest or like somewhere in the wilderness um and then the child has to survive on their own um and that's how they enter adulthood after that they when they when they come back and actually so the 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 whole thing with names is really really interesting in in the book but the child is given uh, a name and by the co-mothers when they're a child but when they go through the um, initiation ritual they are given uh, not, they choose a different name based on the experience that they've had so one of the um one of the people in um one of the people in the book is called jack rabbit and he, um he's chosen that name because of the experience he had um when he um with a rabbit when he was in the wilderness um and after that, the um, 
after the naming or the, the initiation ritual, the child is considered to be an adult now. Um, I think I think the the parents can't um, speak to the child for like uh, six months after the initiation ritual, uh, just to kind of make sure that they don't think of that person as a child anymore. Which is uh, it, it, I think it's just a great idea. It's really uh, yeah, really cute. Um, there is um um I, I should probably wrap up the recap thing uh but the the kind of the there is a feeling in the society in the future society that there is um life is quite easy quite comfortable um there is a little bit of um sadness and and drama when uh, jack rabbit gets killed but um but it's also interesting how that happens because kind of towards the to um, the second half of the book, um, we get um, um, certain things happen in the hospital in like real life or like real New York where um, Connie is, um, and they um, the main I think it's the main doctor um, starts doing um, these experiments on on people in the hospital, which is kind of foreshadowing, um, I guess. Uh, contemporary surveillance techniques, um, the well, not just surveillance, I guess control techniques as well. So the, the um, it's a the doctor is doing this experiment because the whole um, hospital or everybody in the hospital is perceived as kind of unworthy person. They are all fairly poor uh, women of color or people of color, um, black people. Um, um, just it's it's. Um, you know they're considered kind of like expendable bodies, and the doctor wants to uh, is doing this experiment where he's um, uh, implanting this chip in people's heads, uh, which supposedly would make them feel better or like would get rid of the mental illnesses that or mental disabilities that they have. Um, and and it, the way it's done, it's like uh, it suppresses um, whatever region in your brain is. I don't know, making you feel a particular way. Um, so um, that experiment starts, and in the beginning, Connie's a bit um, uninterested in it. She doesn't think um, too much of it. Uh, and then Luciente, the visitor from the future, warns her about it. Says it's um, quite um, dangerous. Uh, it, it, it. At some point, we realise that um, uh, Luciente is. Um, not just kind of concerned about Connie, but um, is talking about how if this experiment is successful, if this if this happens and works, then their society in the future is jeopardized. So it's it's not just that um, that something you know, it's not just bad for Connie. It's she's going to destroy the entire future utopia that Connie kind of hopes to or enjoys being in. Um, and we see that very clearly at some point when. Um, uh, I think it's after one of Connie's friends has the chip implanted um, and he's completely kind of um, non-reactive I suppose he, he just kind of turns into is described a little bit like turned into um, incommunicative and is not himself and it just has absolutely no interest in life it's like his life force is just disappeared out of him um, and she finds that really disturbing and sad Um, and um, that has such um, huge consequences for um, future utopia that um, instead of seeing um, this utopia, Connie sees the future again, but a different kind of future, um, and it's the future of a really powerful totalitarian regime where the rich just live in these platforms of a um like up in the sky and all the poor people are basically dying at the age of 40 because of pollution and the um and uh, like on the on the ground and they're forced to work to maintain the rich people and it's extremely sexist society so connie meets this woman who's um basically like a sex slave to to a rich guy and it's it's all quite disturbing um it's it's it's, it's quite, quite like a huge difference between the two societies um, and I suppose that kind of convinces Connie to um, to think about um, 
what's her role in, in creating that utopia um, and she ends up um, murdering the the people the, the some of the doctors I think the main doctor and some of the nurses in the hospital who are doing the the um, implant um, and I'm gonna end there with the recap um, but what we're gonna do is um, we're gonna follow um, last week's kind of um, trajectory and uh, try to pick out some interesting themes or I've picked out some interesting things sorry um, some themes that maybe I find interesting and you're also obviously welcome to um, to, to like talk about them in the seminar or talk about other ones that you prefer um, and the themes um, and I also realized I didn't do pop one this week but it's okay it's just two themes so hopefully you it's not you didn't need to, to see them written down the themes that I've <clears throat> picked up are um, the relationship between um, uh, I guess like activism and utopia uh, that we we've kind of been dancing around um, and I guess like kind of social change in utopia um, and I think it's um, it's interesting I've picked it particularly for this book because I think it's interesting how um, how it plays out in the book itself but also the role of the book within kind of um, political organizing and and contributing to a better society um, I think somebody um, I think Megan already posted on um, on River that the book draws or is, is inspired by um, Shulamith Firestone's argument um, for um, the role of the revolution and, and kind of how um, we can get rid of gender, gender roles and future society and that's the book The Dialectic of Sex and um, Shulamith is um, a Marxist feminist I suppose uh, who was um, prominently associated with second wave feminism um, which if you are into the waves there you go second wave um, and um, she um, actually I think I mean it would it, be interesting to really compare kind of the details of, of Shulamit's um, dialectic of sex and March Piercy's Woman at the Age of Time uh, but I think it's it's almost like feels like it's one-to-one -one, kind of how uh, Shulamith in mm, well no maybe not one to one but it's it's very close proximity to how Firestone um, imagines the future society um, and um, um, and I think so well I'll, I'll mention two things well, no, I think the relationship between um, um, Firestone and Piercy um, kind of shows relates to both of the topics of um, activism. And political organizing and the topic of difference um, and then when it comes to activism and political organizing uh, what I found um, interesting in the book is how um, uh, well first of all what well, I mentioned that Marge Piercy was herself an activist um, rather than a writer so she talks way more from kind of lived experience than she talks um, from um, I guess <clears throat> fictionalized um, um or like writing um writer sensibilities um and in um woman on the edge of time is really uh um a kind of a hopeful book it's not just um uh, not just because it's hopeful but it's not just hopeful because it's a utopia uh, but it's also hopeful in the way um, it's encouraging um, activism and encouraging people to to contribute to the re revolution um, the the kind of key ideological notion that um, I think she um, um, she expresses in the book is that um, social change requires not just a radical vision but also a radical practice um, and and that's particularly um, obvious in 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 that moment where Connie is um, seeing um, kind of the, the future utopian society, and she's like, "Oh, this is great! I'm, you know, I'm really liking this. It's um, it's, it's very nice." Uh, but at the same time, she doesn't really feel like she has the power to to do anything in in her own world, um, and she feels like. Um, 
um, you know, all of this is, is really quite detached from her. It's not something that she has anything to do with. Um, and I suppose that's, um, um, that's quite interesting when we think about kind of how we or how people organise politically today, um, of, um, especially organising politically in relation to an idea of utopia. Um, so do we, um, you know, when you think about this, this kind of utopian society, do we think about it um, in the sense that we have a personal role in it, personal responsibility, or um, a way of contributing to it, or is it something that's kind of completely detached? Um, and I suppose um, kind of PSC is going a little bit against um, Marxist ideas of the revolution, um, particularly ideas that um, kind of social um, social progress and social history will inevitably read the, lead to the revolution um, and lead to kind of the, the um, so socialist workers' revolution, um, which I think. Um, like I think it's kind of maybe what Connie is feeling is the case in 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 the kind of first two thirds or half of the book. Um, she she doesn't really like I I suppose she's 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 asking a lot of questions about how they got to where they got to, um, and um, and she's understanding it as almost kind of like a linear progression that this this will happen, um, but then. She's challenged with this because, um, as I mentioned, she she's um, certain things happen in her world that have an, uh, uh, an effect on the future world, and then she sees this kind of completely different um, different world. Um, and I think this is um, it, th this kind of like uh, idea of separate futures. Um, obviously, is very popular in sci-fi, um, but it's. Um, um, it's um, um, it's it's kind of explained. Um, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought entirely. So the, this, the in the in the book, it kind of makes a lot of sense that there that there that there are these kind of parallel realities that will result on the basis of um, what happens in today, uh, which I guess is quite a nice way of. Much PSC to kind of put urgency on people's organising in in like you know outside the book in the this world. I can't, how many times can I say the real world without it becoming confusing? Uh, which real world I'm talking about? Um, so to Connie, I've, I've I found this um, good quote. It's actually explained uh, quite nicely. Uh, um, it's one of the people from the Utopian Society, um, and they say. At certain cruxes of history, forces are in conflict. Technologically, is uh, technology is imbalanced. To have too few have too much power. Alternate futures are equally or almost equally probable, and that affects the shape of time. Um, so, not like nothing is kind of really inevitable. There is no such thing as inevitable revolution or inevitable totalitarian society. They are both kind of constantly not constantly at certain moments fighting um and um and intention and depending on what people do it could go one way or the other um and um um so, so connie kind of has to embody that power and um and act upon on the on, on uh, act upon contributing to that utopia uh, so that it can happen um, and, um, and on that note, I suppose it makes sense to move to the second wave feminism and the role it played in in this um, in the book and in this utopian society. Um, in terms of, um, particularly in terms of how difference is conceptualised, um, and I picked the concept of difference for this book um, because. Also of the way difference functions in um, in the book itself. Um, so we have Connie, who is um, literally like three different people, um, and some commentators even argue that she's four different people because uh, Luciente is seen as um, a version of Connie from the future, which is what Connie would be like if she didn't um, 
if she, if she didn't have the life that she had, if she if she was not if she was not growing up in the structural oppression of uh, of the contemporary world. Um, and then we also have um, kind of these um, um, three different societies that are um, extremely different from each other. So we have this kind of post-gender, post-race utopia uh, where everything just seems really smooth and easy and 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 great and we have um this totalitarian society very different and we have our contemporary society which is kind of i guess mm, closer to the totalitarian one to the utopian one um but i don't know maybe you disagree with me on this one um uh, so the concept of difference plays a kind of a huge role in how um the book is presented itself uh, but also um how um the book is positioned in relation to uh to feminism uh, in relation to um post gender utopias um and um i want to talk about difference but uh, and i'm going to use the example of feminism because i think it's um quite illust illustrative uh what's the word no you get the word it it, it exemplifies the concept or it's like an easy way to talk about the concept of difference um but it doesn't mean that this applies only to to feminism or or to this book um and um god where do i start with difference um uh, it's a it, it it's i'll start with the idea um that Deleuze starts with um in difference and repetition which is that um, Deleuze, the same philosopher that I keep mentioning but not sufficiently explaining uh, and then one of his books, um, actually I think his PhD is called Difference Repetition um, and he is looking at uh, the concept of difference in Western philosophy um, where he says, um, he says that the concept of difference in Western philosophy is always uh, being taken or in up until now has been taken as secondary to the concept of identity um, and sameness. And f um, for those of you who attended the Plato and Deleuze class, if you remember um, the um, the bit about the skillful butcher, so so Plato talks about how um, we categorize um, or like the kind of the the methodology of understanding the world through categorizing it into um um into i guess different um sections um he says we can't just um kind of you know, pick a random bunch of things together we have to be you know, like a skillful butcher so we have to understand how to um divide the world into um categories of things that are kind of same enough or like similar enough that they could be put together in the same category um and this is um this is interesting for Deleuze because um it would appear that well, no it would appear but um it, it 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 means that um um to some extent you know we have to ignore um certain differences because they're too big so we can't really um it, it doesn't it doesn't teach us anything to compare um a space shuttle to a sheep because the differences are so big big that we're not going to learn anything about the sheep <laughs> we're not going to learn anything about the space shuttle it's it's too too much of a difference um so things have to be kind of skillfully divided so that they're similar enough which means that fundamentally um things are compar comparable on some level um, and um, and the way this kind of comes into uh, the concept of difference is, um, I suppose, gender being the the, the primary um, oppositional category, and that's kind of I think what Firestone starts with. Um, she says, um, no, she's a Marxist. She says, yeah, Marx is great. Class struggle is great. Yeah, I'm digging it, uh, but actually. Uh, what's, what comes even before class struggle um, is um, kind of sexism or like sexist class struggle. I think, did she call it sexist class struggle? I think she calls it sexist, sexual class struggle. Um, 
and and she says yeah, you know like um, women are the first um oppressed people you know it wasn't it wasn't actually the workers it was women uh which is a a fairly um is is it was um very radical argument at the time uh fairly kind of um well understood arguments now in relation to marxist um feminists um and um um so and so she conceptualizes the the, the difference as a primary um no, sexual difference the difference between men and women as like a primary social um division um and i suppose um the um, it, similar things can or like similar kind of not similar the concept of difference also applies to other social um social categories um it's um in the, looking at um racial difference or, or ethnic difference or um national uh, national difference and not national well like the, on on the um yeah i guess national difference state difference um ableism like able-bodied people and um people with less able bodies etc etc so this um you know this kind of division between um 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 in in society between um in different categories uh, which are based on difference um and um Deleuze and also i guess uh, a lot of no, i guess and other feminists uh, would often argue that this um this history of difference in western philosophy um is actually um it, you know has has real kind of material lethal consequences exclusion on the basis of difference um can be um, um is traced as the reason for um all sorts of kind of social um exclusions and um, um and oppression um and the um, so, so difference is therefore seen as pejorative seen as um oppressive there is always kind of this, the dialectics of self and other right so the the kind of this division of of the main um politically acceptable category uh men and the um the oppressed other category of of women um and the um, the way that this kind of worked in second wave feminism in particular uh, was that um, the, um, um, there was a move towards um, affirmation of particular kind of difference. So the, the move was to try to um, encourage um, women uh, to be uh, to celebrate their difference, to kind of elevate female differences to the same level as as, as men, male differences. No, to to elevate women at the same level as, as men, to celebrate femininity in its various forms, um, and to celebrate, um, I guess, what kind of made women different as its unique um, essence. Okay, yeah, essence is a good word. Um, now. Um, the the interesting thing about second wave feminism which i think is actually not the case in march piercy um is that um a lot of second wave feminism actually relied um heavily on biological essentialism and um and to an extent biological determinism to define its conception of difference uh, so women were um, uh, great because of the feminine essence that they carried, um, and 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 that I think unfortunately has translated in certain forms of uh, trans-exclusive radical feminism. So, kind of the idea of of um, biological essence being um, uh, is is an idea that when you are born with certain physical attributes that um they uh th they um are uh, that carries an inherent um, um set of qualities with them um so i suppose women are caring and uh loving and 
I don't, know if, I don't know if I've forgotten now what women are supposed to be. Um, but you get the idea, so that you're born with certain essence and that's and that's kind of makes who you are. Um, and, um, um, and 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 post-structuralism had a big um, um, it, it, oh, a various post-structuralist authors, including post-structuralist feminists um, like Judith Butler, um, heavily um, criticised that idea of biological essentialism, um, and um, uh, I suppose on, on some level formed the other side of the debate, which is social constructivism, uh, which is the idea that um, we are um, formed by the structures, or that we become who we are because of the structures of, of the society we live in. Um, but there is also um, a slightly different um, concept of difference, uh, which emerges, I suppose, from Deleuze and uh, Lucy Irigaray, who's also uh, kind of a French post-structuralist feminist, um, and um, some of her Mm, students uh, such as Rosie Bradotti, uh, which is um, trying to um, reconceptualize difference as something that's positive, um, and um, it's um, um, it, it's kind of like um, it's it's it, what it's, it's taking from Deleuze is this understanding of difference as a fundamental ontological category, so not something that's in dialectical opposition to sameness or to, to identity, uh, which is the case with most of the humanist tradition. Um, but it's something that is kind of um, difference in itself. So it, it's not um, uh, it's not conceptualized in relation to um, to sameness. Um, and and that means that we we can't really presuppose that two things are really comparable in us in a way that we can kind of categorize them. Um, similarity or sameness for Deleuze is something that's just an appearance, so it's not something that um, is um, it, it has anything to do with essence in that sense. Um, you can't. It's. I think it's. It's like quite intuitive to think of like you know, two things might having have the same process of production. So like you know, two um, raindrops have both fallen from the same cloud because of certain temperatures in the water, uh, sorry, in the air and certain moisture and etc, etc. But that doesn't mean that, um, you know, they share this process of production and, and that's the same process, uh, but they're no, never really the same in any real sense. Um, it, they are, um, like, to presuppose sameness is to presuppose or is to kind of um, privilege this um, this kind of humanist Western way of, um, of thinking, which um, suggests that identity is something essential, basically. Um, and um, what the Rosie is, oh sorry, what Bradotti is um, is taking this to, to, to mean for um, uh, for feminism is that um, there is um, there isn't anything that's kind of uh, natural, like essential about certain types of bodies. Um, there isn't anything that we are inherently born with that makes us women or, or like particular um, um, like um, I lost it anyway that makes us women um, but it's something that um, it, it, it's um, but what we share is this process of becoming a, a woman so like um, becoming this um, uh, we're starting with being different, but we're sharing the same process of becoming woman, which is kind of where um, solidarity and 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 political organising lies. Um, and I think that's that's really um, interesting for the book because um, it's um, it is kind of like a post-gender society where it seems like um, radical of all the kind of this essentialist. Um, is these essentialist ideas have been eradicated in in many ways uh, but at the same time there is um sorry got distracted some noise um so, uh, so the there is this post radical society um so post this radical society that's post gender differences but at the same time everybody is 
kind of portrayed with their own uniqueness and their own difference um, in the sense that the, it's almost like impossible for us to to see how um, any of these people is is really anything in in any way related to anybody else there um, or like it's comparable to anybody else everybody seems seems like their uniqueness has come out in like a really interesting um, way that has nothing to do with um, essentially said yes about gender um, or um, or sex um, and the final thing that I've um, kind of wanted to mention in relation to this and again I think this is kind of how it aligns more with contemporary ideas of, of, of sexual difference um, is um, what was it? I completely lost it um, I think it, it was the, the idea that um, um, how well, it's more, it's, I suppose it's not more of a question but how kind of the role of technology or what is the role of technology in in creating that so the is it really um, do we really have um, this kind of gender difference because of um, because somebody's can care some bodies can carry babies and some can't um, and is this really kind of the the, the ultimate essence um, and um, and I wanted to try to question that a little bit with um, kind of bringing in um, gender queer people's experiences or trans experiences um, on how um, you can be um, a certain body you can be a male body but still have childbearing potential um, or and etc etc and maybe how we can think about um, this in relation to to the book and in relation to kind of the, the idea of uh, biological and nuclear families um, and yeah maybe I'll stop there I wanted to mention something about how um, uh, how um, the society that P March PSC constructs is um, drawing on all sorts of um, kind of different cultures and religions so it's, it's it's um, uh, drawing a lot on uh, Native American culture, on um, uh, kind of black history um, and various currently oppressed um, sister, uh, um, sorry, categories. And I wanted to, us to maybe think about what is the, um, what's the role of of these people in bringing in the uto like utopia or um, or future radical societies, um, it just because it seems to me that she is in some way prioritizing these groups, and I was wondering what what your opinion on that would be, or like how you might understand that. Mm -hmm.